Greetings, Michael Marks here, and you are in the boot camp, <laughs> and it's really a great honor and special occasion for me to be here to introduce Chris McCluskey. Uh, Chris and I have been working together for years. He's really one of the uh, links that connected me with CCN, and that allowed me to become uh, president of CCN and then founding president of CCNI, and so with that introduction, Introduction. I'll go back to Chris being with Judy Santos in 1998, right, Chris? And being, you know, the two people that really got this all together. And uh, he's also one of the um, founding board members of Christian Coaching Magazine as well. Um, so, you know, he really doesn't need much introduction. But Chris is often regarded as uh, the father of the Christian Coaching Movement. And most of you know him from his leadership, from being the founder and president of the Professional Christian Coaching Institute. He's a best-selling author, keynote speaker, entrepreneur, podcast host. Um, he's always raising the standard is his motto. And that's one of the things that I cherish about him the most. He's just been a pioneer in many respects. In fact, in 2014, uh, CC and I recognized him uh, with the very first Judy Santos Award for his pine, pioneering efforts. Um, he also does a wonderful podcast that a lot of you know, the Professional Christian Coaching Today.com. Um, it is consistently ranked as one of the top 100 shows on iTunes in the categories of business, marketing, training, education, Christianity, and religion. Um, you might not know that he was a key consultant to the um, benchmark book that Gary Collins wrote on Christian coaching. Um, he and his wife, Rachel, live in the mountains in the <laughs> Ozarks there in uh, a, a great metropolis called Rolla. What's the population there? 500? <laughs> <laughs> That's generous. <laughs> okay. Um, mm -hmm. And his passions include music, the performing arts, nature, and most of all, his family. Uh, if you talk to Chris for too long, you'll get a couple family stories in there. So, you know, that is the introduction to Chris. I do also want to, you know, tell you about the CCEUs that everyone's always asking about. So let me read this to you. To receive your continuing education certificate, you will need to attend this session until the top of the hour and then complete the survey. The link to the survey was delivered to your email box this morning. Um, I'm saying that in faith, so I'm pretty sure it was because we've been on top of that. You, can, If you cannot locate the survey, please make sure that you're accessing the email address that you used for registration of this seminar. And still, if you can't locate this, please check your spam folder in the event that you are still unable to locate this. Please send uh, Melody an email at director at christiancoaches.com. Okay, um, there will be two passwords. I will interrupt you, Chris, about halfway through for the first password, and then towards the end, right before the Q and A. Um, and that's about it. You know, I think you're good to go. So I will darken myself. I'm right here in the uh, wings to work over the chat. In other words, if you have a question, put it in the chat, and I'll field it to Chris in an appropriate way in an appropriate time, hopefully. Not too obtrusive, um, but Chris, the uh, the floor is all yours. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. I'm sitting here enjoying a cup of Nespresso coffee. Of course, it's <laughs> espresso. That's always what I drink, just the little tiny demitasses. And that is from my friend, Michael Marks, who years ago was out here with his wife, Joy, in their uh, RV when they were traveling the U.S., trying to discern really where God was going to have them land. And Rachel and I, my wife and I, got to go up and spend a wonderful time with them. And he gave me an espresso machine. So I, I got to, right. to become more of a coffee snob than I already was. <laughs> I had two of them and uh, and lived in a camper. So I didn't need two and gave Chris and Rachel one. And he often says that that was uh, my bribe to, to get him to <laughs> hire me. But that's really it happened in reverse order. <laughs> so. That's right. That's right. 
Well, it's great to be with all of you. It's good to see that we have a wonderful turnout for this. I am very excited about this talk. I'm going to come up short on the notion of calling it a workshop, at least in the classic sense. So I'm going to invite you as listeners to be more like participants. And I don't mean interacting back and forth here through Zoom so much as I want you to be engaged with the material that I'm going to cover in a different way than maybe we normally come to workshops, be they live workshops or uh, a virtual one like this. Um, we are focusing on your business success as a coach. Presumably everybody in here has some degree of training. You might be right at the very beginning of take, taking training courses in the field of professional coaching, or you may have been doing this for years and somewhere in between. That, that's surely our makeup here. And so presumably when you see a talk about winning the war within, and it has to do with building your business, everybody is here not only understanding coaching, but wanting, trying, struggling, uh, succeeding hopefully in some cases to launch and grow coaching businesses. That's our focus. That's where I want you to actually be in terms of your internal space with this material. I don't so much want to talk to your left side of your brain analytically. I want to at least integrate the right side and the left. And it's okay with me if you actually wind up kind of drifting over into just the right. In other words, your creative space, your imagination space. You lose for a while whatever's on the screen at the moment, but the, like in a good coaching session, the question that's been posed, you're just being with it and you're hearing things stir up inside you by the Holy Spirit and in communion with yourself that haven't been said or even necessarily prompted. You're just listening at a very deep level to yourself. So we're a whole bunch of coaches. We're going to take a coach approach here to coaching yourself around your business. For more than a decade, I have done a course that used to be a mastermind that I facilitated for Christian coaches who were trained, entered the field, and were trying to grow their businesses. The course is called The Successful Coach, and of course, it's all about the business launch, but the reason I'm mentioning it is because the title I used to have for it was The Accidental Entrepreneur. I thought it was a really cool kind of a catchy title. I still think it is uh, because the reason I chose it was... <clears throat> that the majority of persons who enter this field of coaching are people persons. We don't come to the field as business persons normally. We might have a business background, but generally even that has been as, as someone else's employee running their business, not from a purely entrepreneurial background. So when you couple a people orientation with not a lot of entrepreneurial experience, and then we get into coach training and you realize, ooh, in order to make the phone ring, I need to become an entrepreneur. I don't just need to become a coach. That's what I'm going to do to make money, but I got to become an entrepreneur in order to get the phone to ring. So that's where the title, an accidental entrepreneur came from. It wasn't really what we signed up for necessarily fully consciously. Uh, maybe just kind of thought it would take care of itself or somebody would instantly contract us to, to provide coaching internally for their organization or something. But uh, rude awakening for all of us, if, if that was our thought. And I dumped the name only because it always had to be explained. The accidental entrepreneur, people weren't sure what that meant. So the successful coach, yeah, you know what that means. Um, what we are going to focus on here, as I said, is about facilitating a coaching session for yourself with yourself. You're the coach. I'm not going to coach you. I'm going to, to tee up for you a series of seven specific questions to invite you into an internal examination of whatever your war within is. I obviously chose that title because of sticking with the boot camp theme here. And our war is not mostly with the marketplace, although it might feel like a struggle or a battle for you. It's really ultimately within ourselves with regard to this. There is such a tiny, tiny number of coaches out there who are actually trained and can professionally offer the service that you do. And such a gigantically large, largely untapped even uh, market out there that the challenge is not, can I build a business? Is there a market for this? But instead, what is it inside of me that's going to impair my ability to build the business that clearly could be just going and blowing here. So with that, I'm going to do screen share and pull up for you the slide presentation. But I do this with the caution that mainly what I'm wanting you to do is to engage with the material. Let's get our image all the way up there. So winning the war within, facing the fears of growing your coaching business. It can be done, will we, basically. <clears throat> Excuse me while I cough occasionally here. I'm coming over bronchitis. 
Um, I want you to look first at the abstract. All of you presumably read that. That's part of why you signed up for this. But let's look at what was offered in promoting this particular talk. That's what we're going to be focusing on. None of us were drafted into this field. We all entered it willingly. We are trying to build these businesses now. All of us came to the field of professional coaching thrilled at the prospect of making a living doing what we love, helping people turn potential into reality. Many, however, were not nearly so thrilled with the notion of building a business to enable us to do that, and thus began this war within. This workshop takes a coach approach to exploring a range of internal conflicts that can sabotage the launch and growth of your coaching business. Whoops, why is it not advancing now? Hmm. That's interesting. Well, I'll have to click on the screen there. My keypad is not advancing it. No, no worries. All right. Well, as Christians here, uh, of course, we turn to Scripture first. Now, I have pulled a Scripture out of context, and that's always a dangerous thing. The context here is Jesus speaking about the cost of discipleship, and he uses an illustration, as he so often did. But he did use the illustration because his knew his, he knew his audience would all relate to it. So I'm going to use his illustration here because it does illustrate where all of us are. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost? to see if you have enough money to complete it. For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. That's addressing a very real prospect for every single one of us. We can say, I'm going to enter the field of coaching. I'm going to build a coaching practice, and we can wind up actually not succeeding in that. And largely, it might be because we didn't count the cost at the beginning of the journey. So, let's talk about what that journey is like. There are a lot of myths that people have about business owners. Uh, many of you may uh, be familiar with the book that I so often reference and use as one of my core texts in that course, The Successful Coach. It's called The E-Myth, and E is for entrepreneur. One of the biggest entrepreneurial myths that most people hold about business owners is that your typical entrepreneur is an Elon Musk or a Steve Jobs or a, or a Bill Gates or, or a Richard Branson type person. In other words, just kind of almost larger than life. And, and you've got to be that way in order to be able to launch and grow a successful business. And that is absolutely a myth. Those people do grow incredibly successful businesses, but the vast majority way larger than those occasional people like a Jeff Bezos or something is people like you and me. We are the vast majority of people who start and grow and run all of the businesses, large and small, throughout the world and certainly in the Western world. So if that's an assumption that we have that, um, that we need to be somebody other than maybe who most of us feel like we are, that could be an internal war within that we would struggle with before we even launch. Oh, I'm not that kind of person. Well, wait a minute. You mean the majority of people who do this are like me? Yep. Okay, well, that myth's busted. So what do I do now I'm here? Well, welcome to the crowd of how most entrepreneurs enter the field of starting your own business. Not enter the field of coaching, but the field of starting your own business. They enter it with what Michael Gerber in that book, The E-Myth, calls an entrepreneurial seizure. And all that means is just that you have this wild hair idea. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take the plunge. I'm very excited about the prospect of making my living as a coach. And in that state of exhilaration, I've prayed this through enough to where I'm just going to pull the trigger. Here we go. Gerber says that that is the state in which almost every, quote, normal person enters entrepreneurism. Out of the world of employment that most of us have lived in, we enter in a state of exhilaration through what he calls the entrepreneurial seizure. In other words, something that's very, very um, moving of all of your being, but not necessarily long lasting. A seizure is a very short thing, thankfully. He says that is always followed by a massive reality check. And our internal experience of that reality check is terror, <laughs> abject terror. What in the world have I done? What was I thinking? I can't do this. This is overwhelming. And so, unless we just, in that internal state in our amygdala there, in the fight or flight state, unless we just run, we take flight and, and say, forget about it. I, I must have eaten something weird last night that made me do that. Instead, most of us stick with the commitment we made, 
We already told some people we're going to do it. We've already signed up for the classes. We're already this deep in financially or whatever. And so in that state of terror, realizing how much is actually ahead of us, we do what for most of us we've always done. Head down, nose to the grindstone, don't come up for air, right? Just muscle through this thing. And he says that leads to the third state that almost all entrepreneurs find themselves in, a state of exhaustion. Because we're just working harder at doing something that's new to us, and we are very aware, painfully aware, that we don't feel we have what, what it's going to take in order to make it succeed, but we don't know what else to do. So we work ourselves into a burnout over a period of a couple of years. Most small businesses take anywhere from two years to three years to launch and grow, and it might take three to five years before it really is just running like a well-oiled machine. So the vast majority of people who have that entrepreneurial seizure, just like you and me, they enter in, the exhilaration fades away to terror, they find themselves exhaustedly working themselves to death, and instead they end up in despair. And that's a state we as Christians never want to find ourselves in. But the despair comes not because we misheard God or because we couldn't have done this thing that we hopefully did feel he had called us to. And it's not because we don't have a faith in what God can do. It's just an awareness that what we're doing isn't working. And God's not going to do the part that's for us to do. The challenge for us in that state is to recognize, wait a minute, I need to, as the old saying goes, be working smarter instead of so much harder. I can't work any harder. How do I work smarter? That's what we're focusing on. And so here's your coaching agreement with yourself, hopefully. I'm taking the reins of being your coach only long enough to get you into coaching yourself mode. And I'm going to feed you first-person questions that you can ask to yourself. If you don't already have a notebook, I would encourage you to grab one. If you use a journal daily, maybe grab your journal. But at least get a notebook and scribble these questions down to yourself. I actually considered doing this workshop in a manner that I would pose the question and leave a moment of silence while people journaled. And while that might have been pretty powerful for some, my guess is that it's not terribly compelling listening for the remainder who aren't quite wanting to journal right at that moment or who feel rushed by only having a minute or whatever. So we're not going to do that, but I'm going to feed you those questions and oh, my brothers and sisters, I urge you to be with those questions. Don't take this as a course. Don't take this as a CE kind of a thing. Don't, don't attend this as a workshop. Embrace this as a coaching opportunity. Focus on your vision for this private practice. My guess is every single one of us would at least identify with these qualifiers about our private practice. We would say internally, well, I do want to grow a private coaching practice. I want my practice to be financially successful. I want my practice to be personally fulfilling. Stewarding my gifts and my talents before the Lord and facilitating the vision that I feel God's given me for this season of my life. And I think that all of us would say that we want our practices to be pleasing and glorifying to God. That's four things that weren't very hard for me to put down there because I don't think I'm being overly presumptuous. We all are here because we want to grow a private practice that's financially successful, personally fulfilling, and glorifying to God. So there it is. Coaches always start with a big vision. There it is. So let's jump into some powerful questions, what we all do as coaches. These are from yourself to yourself, about yourself, exploring seven specific internal issues that can prove sticking points a war within. First one is this. And again, I encourage you to jot it down and commit to some personal journaling on it long after this workshop's over. What is my sense of calling to this profession of Christian coaching? Calling is the operative word there. Calling comes from the Lord. We know that the Lord gifts and calls his children. Those gifts and calling are irrevocable. We know that each of us has received a calling first to follow him, and then in that to take up our cross, in, in fulfilling that for which we were created to his glory. And each of you has probably in one way or another explained to others what you're doing in terms that would use that word calling. I feel like God is calling me to this. What is your sense of calling to this profession of Christian coaching? How have I expressed to others my pursuit of this profession? the notion of building a private practice. 
when I'm talking to my friends, if I said, oh man, you know, I just, I've been praying about this and I've talked it over with my spouse. And I just really feel like this is a season, blah, 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 blah. We're talking about calling. Are we putting a Christian spin on anything? Are we trying to actually out loud convince ourselves about that? Sometimes we can do that quite easily. I mean, I'll be the first to admit it. How am I expressing it to others? And the, the really key piece of this question, have I genuinely prayed this thing through? Have I arrived at a place of confirmation and conviction about investing myself in this major career shift? Because here's the deal. Calling at one level can be something that we can just kind of talk about and very enthusiastically gloss over. At the level we're talking about here, where you are going to be reorienting your life in many, many areas to invest years of your life and serious money that you could be investing in other things and a whole lot of energy around a huge shift in the thing that provides for you financially. If you also sense that that is something that God has called you to, my brother, my sister, that means you believe you're going to give an account for that calling before our master, just like me, before his throne one day after we've pled the blood. And thankfully, that's, that's our, that's our uh, ticket in the door, so to speak. Then we answer for what we have done. And the things he wanted us to do was the things that he had created and called us for, like the parable of the talents. If that's where you are, then it's probably not too strong of a statement to say there's no turning back. We will pursue the calling well or poorly, fully or marginally, but we are on that path of pursuing that calling. So let's go to a second internal question that we need to be sitting with, being with, as we deal with the real struggles of building a successful coaching practice. What's my mindset about this calling? As coaches, we work with mindset a lot. We hear the saying all the time, if you say you can or you can't, you're probably right. Our mindsets can set us on trajectories that are going to lead to, in many ways, kind of self-fulfilling prophecies or keep us from ever getting started. If we keep rehearsing over, oh, I just can't do that entrepreneurial thing. I'm not cut out that way. Well, bet you're not going to succeed at it, even though I know you could, especially if you say and believe that you were called to it. God, is, God equips those he calls. We would actually be selling God short if we say, well, he gave me a call, but I don't have the stuff for it. No, that's our mindset. And that's what we need to, again, just be with, with ourselves and before him. Is it okay to build a truly successful business? Do you believe that? Do you have a confirmation about that before God? Let's mess with our languaging here a bit. Is it important to build a successful business? Not just okay. Wait, if I'm called, is it important that I do this? Ooh, wait a minute. Is it imperative that I build a successful business if God's called me to it? That's a bit of a leading question, isn't it? What do I mean by truly successful? What do I believe God would mean by truly successful? Now, understand, successful is a big word. It means a lot more than just financially successful, but financial success is going to be one of the gauges. For all of us, if you can't figure out how to make it pay the bills, you'll be doing something else with a tremendous amount of your time and energy and attention. So success does include financial, but it's by no means only financial. What is my mindset about this calling? A third question to be with. What do I most fear in this endeavor? I know as Christians, we bristle a lot of times, and boy, if somebody asks us what we're afraid of, oftentimes our first reaction is, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm a Christian. You know, I have no fear. The reality for all of us is that it's not that we won't feel the feeling of fear. The question becomes, what are we going to do in the face of that? Fear is actually a good thing. If I burn my hand on the stove, I develop a healthy fear of stoves that might be hot. And I utilize that, that wisdom, right, 
that, that good reality testing to say, ooh, there's something to be feared there for my self-protection, for my good, for the betterment of my children and all. And so in that healthy fear of something, I choose specific actions. There are things to fear in an endeavor like building a business. You can lose your shirt financially. You can go into bankruptcy. You can burn yourself out. Many have trashed their marriages, their health, lost seasons they can never get back with their kids, lost opportunities that they might have been able to pursue career-wise. See, those are realities in the face of anytime we say yes to one thing, we say no to a whole bunch of others, right? And so we fear what we might be letting go of. We fear what this is going to cost. The challenge is what do I do in that? Fear just invites us to either fight or flee, or of course we know in the amygdala we can freeze or appease, right? We're wanting to not flee in the face of the fear. We're bringing it to the Father and saying, okay, these emotions are here. I don't want to keep moving in this. What do I do, Lord? I'm afraid of embarrassing myself. You know that passage they started this workshop out with? I don't want to be ridiculed by others. Am I more afraid actually of disappointing others? my spouse, my kids, my parents, anybody else who has been a cheerleader for me, an encourager? Am I afraid of proving to myself that I don't have what it takes? You know, I mean, nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? What if I just kind of say that this is, you know, going to be kind of someday aisle? <laughs> You've heard that phrase before, right? Playing on the word aisle, like, like an island out somewhere, but, but, but I apostrophe LL. Someday I will. We can live on someday aisle. And sometimes the reason for that procrastination, that putting off is because we're afraid that if I seriously roll up my sleeves and engage in this thing fully, I might prove to myself that I don't have what it takes. Again, that, that's a false belief. That's a lie. But we can believe it in our fear. And so we want to face it now. Don't try to pretend it's not there. Feel the fear and move toward it to work through it. Am I afraid that I could lose everything we have financially? Maybe I need to listen to that fear long enough to ensure that I don't gamble everything, unless I really feel like God's calling me to gamble everything. Sometimes he does tell us to just burn the ships, right? <laughs> but other times he doesn't. God gave us a brain and he expects us to use it. He's not going to do for us what we can do for ourselves. So if you fear losing everything financially, that's not a bad thing. Listen to the fear and figure out what to do with it. Do I maybe have a different fear altogether? Do I maybe fear success? <laughs> I got a sense if I really invested myself in this, I might actually kill it. I might really be able to tear this thing up. And oh my goodness, what would that mean? And I mean, you can fill in the blank with all kinds of things. We all have different internal struggles. Don't focus so much on these extra extrapolations that I'm putting up here of these questions. The main thing for you to focus on is the bold-faced question here. What do I most fear? The first one was, what do I believe about my sense of calling? Second was, what's my mindset? And then here, what do I most fear? Take a deep breath. Be with this, and let's move on into another powerful question. What is my internal narrative, specifically regarding money? Now, we all know that we have all kinds of narratives inside of ourselves, the stories that we tell ourselves. A lot of times, they're borrowed stories. They were stories that other people gave to us, well-meaning or maybe not so well-meaning, criticisms that we've had or people who were encouraging us toward things, a teacher who told us that we had something or some great ability or a parent or, or whatever. But then we also begin to adopt and rehearse our own internal narratives, and those stories often create, again, that self-fulfilling prophecy. So when we're looking at success, and again, financial success being one of the primary gauges, because if our business doesn't succeed financially, 
we ain't going to be able to work the business very long. So all the other things like being able to be portable with your lifestyle and work from home and being able to care for your loved one that that would have allowed or be able to travel and visit the grandkids or be able to short, do short-term mission trips or be able to steward these gifts, all of that is going to go by the wayside if it doesn't work financially. You're going to have to go out and find some other way to pay for those groceries when you go through the Kroger's checkout line. <laughs> right? Good intention doesn't cut it. We got to have that green stuff. So what is my internal narrative regarding money? My experience is that for whatever reasons, a lot of Christians struggle with money. Interestingly, when you look at our Judeo-Christian roots, the Jewish people did not seem to have nearly so much of a struggle as I experience in many Christians internally. In fact, there are a lot of sometimes off-color and poorly worded uh, jokes about Jews, but Jews will talk openly about their own culture's narrative regarding money. And for various reasons, oftentimes because they've spent so much time in the crucible of being hated by so many other cultures, they were forced to come to terms with the reality of how important it is to make money, to be able to actually have success, and they've gotten very good at it in many cases. I find that a lot of times Christians have something much closer to kind of a, an internal poverty mindset or narrative going on. Somehow we've warped out that, that, that issue about the love of money being the root of all evil, and we've lost the word love of, that, that phrase, and just money is the root of all evil. No, money, money is the root of why there's so much scripture about money. Money is addressed more than any other significant topic in our lives, including baptism or prayer. Money is all over the scriptures because God knows it's going to be important. And oftentimes when it's addressed, it's about the wise stewarding, the effective handling of it. Many of us, if we're really honest internally here about a war within, in regard to launching and growing a successful coaching practice, have some internal narratives regarding money that we need to come to terms with. What is my internal narrative regarding the making of significant money? I don't mean just enough to survive. Oh, yeah, that's okay. You know, scraping together enough nickels to do something. No, thriving. Where am I internally with that? What's my internal narrative regarding charging for my services? Oh, I can't do that. I can't tell you how many times I hear that. And I get that. But guess what? That's an internal war within. You are going to have to wrestle that baby through because that's how this works. You are building a business in order for you to be able to make a living charging for coaching services. What's your internal narrative about that? What's my internal narrative regarding God's interest in me making and handling money. Do, do I wonder if he even cares? Do I wonder if he kind of looks at it and goes, yeah, yeah, look, I've got that. Don't worry about it. Am I thinking like man is going to just fall from heaven for me? Am I, am I actually not embracing the internal struggle and Christianizing it? Saying, oh, God's got that. I don't worry about it at all. My brother, my sister, lovingly, in the greatest spirit that I know to try to reach out to you as a fellow sibling on the journey, don't go there. Do not slap a Christian bumper sticker on the reality of our need to make money in this life. I'm not at all suggesting that we do it without God. I'm suggesting that God doesn't do it without us. It's cooperative. What is my internal narrative regarding God's interest in me making money and handling that money? What's my theology of financial abundance? Do I have financial abundance in the same space as all the other blessings that I know my scriptures speak of, that the Lord came to give me this abundant life, right? shaken together, packed down, overflowing. Where am I with regard to money specifically on that score? I'm going to move us along because I know those are, those are hitting some pain points for some people, and perhaps I've already gotten you into your judger mindset, and you're focusing on Chris McCluskey right now instead of yourself. Hey, look, if you're not squaring with what I'm challenging you here, I'm not asking you to swallow it. I'm asking you to consider it. Hey, Chris, before you go to the next slide, I just wanted to give the passcode word uh, for this half, and yes, that yes. is two words, the 
Lord, T-H-E-L-O-R-D, two words, that will not be repeated at the end. To get the second half of the passcode, you do have to be listening all the way to the end. And also, of course, if you want to ask a question, there should be a little tab at the bottom of your screen or I think on a Mac device um, on the top, iPad, you know, Q&A, put your question in there, or we can also feel it from the chat. Back to you, Chris. Terrific. Thanks, Michael. Good. Actually, good timing. That gave us a break. <laughs> yeah. If you're in any way, shape, or form bristling because of Chris McCluskey and thinking about what my mindset and, with, and what agenda I'm pushing, I think I'm being transparent about what I'm challenging you and encouraging you with as a brother. But look, don't get stuck there. Don't get stuck there. These are invitations. These are powerful questions to ponder. Go back to being in that receptive space within yourself with these before God, not before me. Question number five then that I'm inviting you to is what does my business need to generate financially? Now, I use my words pretty carefully. That word is not what do I want my business to generate or what do I think is possible? I'm specifically focusing on need and I'm urging us to do the due diligence. Back to Jesus's quote about sitting down and calculating the cost. There is a real number and it's fairly hard for most of us, meaning firm. There's a fairly firm number, depending on what our life expenses are, that we need to see coming into our bank accounts on a monthly basis. What is that number? And then that number plus whatever else it's going to take to, to make your business run, to keep the lights on, to, to pay the bills that your business will have, to, to cover yourself for health insurance and those kinds of things. Again, that's a pretty hard number. There's a firm number out there. Do you know it? Do you know what that number is for you? If you do, great. If you don't, then you want to camp out there. What does my business need to generate financially? Gross, that would mean the total amount in the door. And then after I've paid the expenses and covered the insurance and covered taxes and all, then how much do I actually put in that we use to buy those groceries and, and pay our mortgage and, and whatever all the other things are? Oftentimes, and I, I mean, I've totally lost track of any ability to count it. Oftentimes, what I hear among new Christians Answering what they say was a call to the field. When it comes down to the finances of it, they'll say, you know, whatever it makes, is, is, it's fine with me. I'm not really all that about money. Um, I've got, and then they'll tell me whatever their other sources of income are. Those same people will come back to me six months later and say, you know, it's becoming a little more important for me to look at the money of this. I'm putting a lot of effort into this, and it's not really paying off. Okay, well, so we can at least be with this question now that we needed to have been with from the beginning because it's a real question. It has to be addressed. For most of us, the answer is not, yeah, whatever it makes is truly fine. We're not just dabbling. This isn't truly just a hobby. Even if we're just looking to supplement other income that you have, cool. What is my need to supplement the family income? I mean, supplementing it is presumably not just so we can go blow it on baseball games or something. What are those needs? Again, they have a solid dollar figure. And most of us wind up trying to reach that nebulous, ill-defined place all the time instead of having clearly identified it and winding up shooting over it. You heard Michael say at the beginning, one of my mantras is raising the standard. I'm always about raising the standard. We are to shoot over the bar. One of my buddies years ago was a, um, a pole vaulter you know, where you run with this big long stick and plant it in the ground and go flying up over a pole. And I recall him having told me very clearly, Chris, one of the first things he teaches is you never, ever, ever look at the pole, the, the bar up there that you're trying to clear. And you definitely don't look at the space underneath the bar. The only place you allow your eyes to even go is the open space over top of the bar because that's where you have to be. That's what you're shooting for, is over the bar. You look at anything else and you will hit the bar or you won't even make it at all. So what does my business need to generate? Is my, what is my need to supplement our family income? What is my need to replace our family income? Many of you, including myself when I went into this, said, you know what? I think I can make this my full-time living and I think I could actually make a better living at it than whatever I'm doing right now. Cool. What's that translate to? Dollars and cents wise. Do you know it? Do I need to make more 
than our current income. <laughs> How much more? Again, a hard number. Gang, I got four kids in college right now, and I've got three more coming behind them. <laughs> Thankfully, that's in this season of my life and not a previous one. But I had a real wake-up call as to what it was going to take in order to get those kids into college and through college, and these are private colleges. So do you know those numbers? Do you know what you're shooting for? Big breath again. We're going to stay with some of that. Question number six is, what does my business need to do in order to generate that much gross income? We are really staying in the hard work, not the theoretical, not the airy-fairy, pie-in-the-sky kind of stuff. And we're not just, like I said, kind of slapping a bumper sticker over anything. We are in the real hard work of those things that if we were looking at our fears internally at the beginning, that are why we do kind of lose some sleep over this at times, why it does bring a state of internal anxiety. Gang, I get that. I promise I get that. I'm not shaming it. I'm inviting us to own it and to walk toward it because it's normal. In fact, it's supposed to be there there would be something wrong with our reality testing, something not working right in the brain God gave us if we didn't have these concerns and if they didn't put us into a state of anxiety or fear, concern, that is to challenge us as to how we are going to fight. Again, the issue is not the fear, it's what are we going to do with it. Internal war within. What does my business need to do in order to generate that much gross income. How many clients at how much per month do I need every month in order to generate that? Have we asked ourselves that? Have you sat down and crunched the number? Grab your calculator. Doesn't matter if you're not a numbers person. We can all do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's all it, all it takes here. If I got to have 25 clients, let's just use that formula right there. If I got to have 25 clients, at $400 a month each, every single month, that'd be 12 times a year, 12 months a year, 25 clients, that's not a huge caseload, that's a very manageable caseload, at $400 a month, every single month, in order to generate $120,000 a year, then I have a clear idea. Yeah, I need to be over 100,000, if that's what you're, I'm just pulling a number out of the air, but if that was what your magic number was, Okay, hey, now I know what it takes. I got to get 25 clients, at least, right? And they've got to be paying at least $400. Be very cool if I can get it over that. And they need to be with me on a consistent basis. I can't have some decent months and some terrible months. Now, whatever your numbers are, you just, you run it that way. In fact, I encourage you run it six ways to Sunday. Run it every way you could think of. And what other streams of income could I generate within this business to supplement? I don't recommend that people focus when they're coaching only on private one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. I think that's a good base for us. I think somewhere between 15 to 25, if, if you're doing this full-time, 15 to 25 full-paying clients is a good solid base because typically when we get a client, that client stays with us month after month. My average length of stay once I secure a client is 19 months. So I figure a year and a half or so, if I get a new client, they're going to stay with me for that kind of period of time. That's a nice recurring income every single month. I just run that charge through again. So I'm not having to scramble with feast and famine, feast and famine. It, it provides a base with 15 to 25 clients. But hey, there's 40 hours at least in a, in a work week typically for most of us. And many of us, if we're doing our own business, I know we're probably going to put in more like 50-ish hours, maybe even up to 60 at times. So what else could you do? Are you speaking anyway in order to secure those clients? Can you start to move toward some, some keynote speeches that you get paid for? Can you get paid to market yourself? Because that's another stream of income if you're getting paid for the speaking. Can you write? Can you do any kind of a newsletter or a blog that people subscribe to that winds up perhaps getting advertising or that gets affiliate links connected to it that can generate income? Do you utilize uh, testing, personality testing, career aptitude testing, spiritual gifts testing, you know, you name it. There's all kinds of, uh, of aptitude uh, inventories and assessments that we can do 
Well, you can charge an upsell for those. Can you charge $25, $50, $75, $150 for a 360 inventory with people? That's another stream of income. Have you ever dreamt of writing a book? Could you write a book? Could you write a book that you could actually sell? That's a product. Do you use a schematic model that you've developed that you, you help some of your clients coach through? Uh, many of you are familiar with Gary Wood, um, past president here of, of CCNI and one of our instructors here at PCCI. Uh, Gary has a wonderful model. It's a proprietary model that he developed, the, coach, the uh, clarity and momentum model. That's a product. That's another stream of income. He's built a whole certification program around that. Has a group of affiliates and associates through that. See, he, he does private clientele. I'm just using Gary without his permission even here because he's a good friend. I know he'll appreciate the, the shout out. But, um, but those are illustrative of other streams of income. Understand, though, I'm encouraging us to look at them only after we have built some kind of a stable base. You want that recurring revenue from private clientele. In any given month, you're going to have a client or two drop out. Hopefully, in any given month, you can secure a new client or maybe even two new clients. Don't set it up where every month you've got to have six to ten new clients. You're going to have to be a marketing machine to do that. But just being with this question, what does my business need to do in order to generate that much income and how much overage, back to that notion of the bar on a pole vaulting, how much overage do I need to cover surprises that are going to come up or periodic shortfalls a lot of times, you know, the, the summer months are a bit of a slump and or the holidays, okay? So how do you generate some of that overage? There's any number of answers to these questions. The key for us today is, are we sitting with the questions? And finally, we to our seventh question here. <clears throat> what are, excuse me there, what are the space requirements for my business? Now, we instantly think of physical space, and that is one of the issues. Physical space. Where am I going to do this? On the kitchen table? <laughs> on the kitchen counter? On that drop-down desk that sits out in our living room where everybody's always running around and where my junk would sit out and have to be cleaned up and packed away when we were having guests over? Yeah, I don't recommend that. Am I going to work out of a briefcase? Eh, I don't recommend that. But where are you going to do this business? Many of you have already answered that question. Many of you haven't actually and you are operating off of the kitchen table or some kind of a borrowed space that you really haven't moved into and claimed and made your own. This is my office. I've received pictures of people who, who converted a walk-in closet because they didn't have a spare bedroom. They didn't have kids who had empty nested yet. They didn't have an attic space that can be converted. They didn't want to utilize the, the garage space and, and, and build out a little stick built kind of a thing there and run air conditioning and, and heating out to it. But you want some physical space. What is it? Where is it? What do you need to do in order to build it out? Likewise, time space. I'm not obsessed on these. These are obvious, but where is it going to fit in your calendar? Again, many of you have already answered this question. Many of you haven't. Coming to terms with the war within, if we don't answer these questions, we will find ourselves every day lying down to bed going, Ugh, I didn't get to it again. Man, I got to get to that thing. Well, listen to that self. When? What kind of time is it going to take? What am I going to have to let go of? What am I going to have to say no to? Where can I carve out the space in my calendar? Time space. Mental, emotional, relational space. Yeah, guess what? <laughs> this, this talk is surely turning up a lot of emotion inside of us and stressing us out perhaps mentally. And, and it may cause tension in our relationships. We need, may need to have some very serious sit-down talks with those who are going to be affected by our decision to answer the call to grow a successful coaching business. What are those? What do we need to do in order to address that, to create the mental and emotional and relational space that will be necessary to support this? Again, so we don't just burn ourselves out. What about my energy, my health? <laughs> do I have enough? If I don't, what do I need to do? Financial space. What's it going to take? It takes money to make money. How am I going to float this thing long enough to do that two to three years Chris was talking about a few, few uh, moments ago? Right? Oftentimes, what, what kills a new business launch is just that it couldn't stay afloat long enough to turn its corner financially to start generating what it was actually capable of. So where is your financial space? Is there a, a nest egg somewhere? Is there something you could cash in that, that you feel good about and, and have wrestled through with your spouse if you're married? 
Is there another supplemental source of income that your spouse is making or retirement income that you have? Is there a part-time gig that you need to land in order to just provide stable income while you also beg, borrow, and steal the time in order to create this thing? Right, a side hustle? Spiritual space. Oh boy, do we need to be tuned into the Father. If we believe he's called us and we're answering that call and we know we're in for some hard work, we better be really tuned into him because it won't be the, the case that he's not speaking to us. It'll be the case oftentimes that we're not listening. We're not making the time. We're not practicing the disciplines of our faith. Our, our faith. We're not in a good space. Our prayers are actually hindered, right? We can do things or not do things that will hinder that. I don't want to be doing that. So what do I need to do in order to create the spiritual space for this huge challenge? Now, I've taken us, <laughs> big breath again, I've taken us through several powerful questions there. I'm not sure we're going to have time for questions on this call. I'll keep watching the time, but I want to be sure we get through the slides. And I think we can do that if I stay on task. So bear with me here. And it's good that you're at least asking questions. Be sure that even if I can't get to them here, that you don't leave them out there flapping in the breeze. Chase down their answers. You can certainly email me privately. You can look into other things online, other groups, post in CCNI, check with mentor coaches, etc. But it's good if you're asking questions. Let's be sure we get through the material here. And so I'm inviting us now, having posed seven very powerful questions that we need to be with, to do some active listening, listening to ourselves. We talked at the very beginning about our vision for a private practice that's financially successful, personally fulfilling, and glorifying to God. Well, from vision, we move to mission, right? What is the mission for all of us now? What's your mission, soldier? Right? State your name, rank, and serial number, and what's your mission? What's our mission now? I would suggest that in regard to those questions, it's to remain in those questions. Again, not treating this like some workshop going, well, that was a lot of good stuff to think about. I'll have to do that someday. <laughs> nope, you missed it. <laughs> Be with those questions. Practice active listening to yourself through all of these tools that we know we have, and there are many more. I'm just throwing them all up there through journaling, as I've advised you to do, through prayer, through fasting, through private retreat, processing it with your spouse or loved ones, researching, coaching. Be active in being with these questions. All right. Shift again. Another of our coaching competencies, right? We move on from powerful questions and active listening to some direct communication. This is, this is from me, but it's actually from every successful coach. These kinds of direct communications to you, I think anybody who's actually done the hard work and is just killing it out there in the coaching profession, and there are many of us, we would look back and say, man, I'm making way more than I ever dreamt of making. And the whole world is, is my oyster. I travel, I'm involved in missions work, I'm serving on boards, I'm portable, I'm getting to be with the grandkids and I'm doing all kinds of things that I couldn't do back when I was shackled to the nine to five, right? I, I did that, I love the title of the book, Escape from Cubicle Nation. I escaped from Cubicle Nation. I am running a successful, personally fulfilling, God-glorifying private practice out of my home. Well, here's some direct communication from anybody who's already in that space. They would say to any of you listening that there are some reasons to, in, in, in uh, military lingo, to halt, <laughs> to stop yourself. If you recognize right now that in these 40 some odd minutes we've been talking, your excitement about this profession is outweighed by your fear. I don't mean that you've got fear. Good, join the, join the crowd and that's a good thing. What are you gonna do with it? But if that fear outweighs your excitement, I encourage you to stop. I don't mean stop altogether pursuing the business. I mean, don't keep just doing the business and trying to pretend that that fear's not there. Cause um, it is. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You don't want to just keep moving forward on the trajectory of taking more courses and acting like you're launching a business when you're actually terrified that there's no way in the world. No, stop. Be with that fear. Coach around that. 
wrestle that through and then come back when there's still some fear, but your excitement outweighs the fear, your determination, your response to the call. Secondly, if you are uncertain about the all out pursuit of success, halt. If you recognize that you're still in a mindset that's kind of best described as dabbling, as experimenting. You're, you're one of those dip my toes in the water and, and maybe wade in from the shallow end. That's okay. But if you're serious about answering a call to build a successful business that's personally fulfilling and glorifying to God, that's going to require an all-out pursuit at some point because it's just too hard otherwise. So stop until you figure out how you can invest in an all-out pursuit. And thirdly, if your business model doesn't clearly work financially on paper, hey, stop. That's why I use the words from Jesus himself. Sit down first and count the cost. Be sure that you know what it needs to make and how it could make that. If it doesn't work on paper, if you look at it and you go, well, I don't see any way, but God's going to take care of it anyway. I say to you, in all God-honoring fashion, don't move on that. Don't adopt that kind of Christian thinking that says, well, attempt something so huge that unless God shows up, it's going to fail colossally. I personally don't see that as faith. I see that as folly. I, I know I'm probably stepping on stones. That's okay. Again, you don't have to swallow it. But I am loving you enough at least to be honest with you. It grieves me when people have spent a lot of money on training and they're crying because on the phone with me because they haven't addressed the hard work of setting up a business that can allow them to coach. That's a bummer. All right. Instead, assuming that you are invested and you're ready to continue moving forward, you move from your vision to your missions and you start pursuing some goals. Our goals are to take stock of ourselves. In the final analysis, your business is going to be a direct reflection of you. <laughs> you got to work smarter, not harder. Michael Gerber is going to suggest that you actually split yourself into three selves. Now, we're not going to go into this. This is a whole other workshop. But you see parenthetically there, I've said, learn deeply what this means. He says, since it's you who's going to build this business, you want to do this not as a technician, a doer, just working yourself into exhaustion and despair. You want to do this as the entrepreneurial part of yourself and the managerial part of yourself. Leave that technician to the side. Your entrepreneurial self is the vision oriented, the creative part of you that says, ooh, wait a minute, I could do this. I could do that. I could do this other thing too. How exciting. And then your manager self steps up and says, great idea, Chris. Love that. How can we do that? That's yourself talking with yourself, but you do the business to work smarter, not harder in your entrepreneurial and managerial self. So determine to work on your business not simply in it. A technician just works in the business, shows up, head, to the, head down, nose to the grindstone, don't come up for air and burns themselves out. That's working in the business. Step back from it. Work on it as a separate thing. Strategize in your entrepreneurial self. Organize in your, in your systemic managerial self. Michael, I'm going to give you a break here in just a second to give us that second code. In fact, why don't I just do that right now? You want to give us the second code? Thank you, Chris. Absolutely. The second code is will provide. W I L provide P R O V I D E will provide. Good, good. And thank you. Yeah, clearly we won't have time for questions, but again, I'm okay with that. We're just about through with the slides. Determine to work on your business, not simply in it. Set aside significant blocks of time. Remember back to looking at your calendar space every week. Devoted entirely to your entrepreneurial self and your managerial self. You just, just leave that doer part alone and clarify your vision, clarify your mission, clarify those goals, and then, your third point, commit significant time in your entrepreneurial and managerial self, building out systems. That's our key takeaway. If building a successful business is key to you being able to do coaching, then the key to building a successful business is systems, right? There's the secret sauce. This is your key to working smarter instead of harder. Key takeaway from today. Michael Gerber says it and many others would concur. In the end, if you had a viable business model, in other words, it could have worked, which coaching certainly can, which could have succeeded, but it doesn't. 
it will not actually be the case that your business failed. It'll be that your systems failed. You either won't have built your systems in your entrepreneurial manager yourself, or having built those systems, you didn't work them. You didn't stick with the, with the plan. <laughs> you know, the old adage, plan the work and then work the plan. <laughs> so you got to plan the work and you got to work that plan. Your systems are what enable you to work smarter. Your systems are built by your entrepreneurial and managerial self working on your business, not simply in it. Whoo, now that's a lot covered in our time there, but I hope I have downloaded a lot that you'll be able to reflect back on. I hope you'll be able to be with those questions. I certainly invite you to follow our podcast there. I don't make a penny off that podcast, but it's free information every week. So you see the URL there, professionalchristiancoachingtoday.com. If you listen on iTunes and all, you can certainly subscribe to us on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever you listen to podcasts on every single week good, good material to encourage you on the journey. And if you have interest in any of the courses that we offer, of course, you know the Institute, professionalchristiancoaching.com. Scads of courses out there, and we have a whole team of academic uh, advisors who'll be happy to help you. Always there to field questions. Blessings on the journey to all of you. Michael, I'll toss it back to you. Thanks. <clears throat> Great, Chris. You're immaculately on time and getting great comments here in the chat. Excellent. You know, thank you. Uh, love the information. Um, so super practical, challenging, reflective, wonderful session. Um, again, Chris, thank you. It's always uh, just phenomenal to hear you speak. You're a just free flowing, wonderful. I just love your verbiage. You just have this way of, stringing words together that just makes sense every word you say so good job there um, michael thank you that's a nice that's a high compliment thank you <laughs> <Appreciate> <laughs> well, it's that. really true and um we don't have uh, really any questions that i could identify right now so okay. we're good to go and we can stop the recording at that point and again i thank you very much all right blessings all all right